Hi everyone, welcome to Textile Talks. I am Emma Parker, Project Manager at the Quilt Alliance. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's so lovely to see people joining from all over the country and all over the world. Textile Talks is a weekly series presented in partnership by the Quilt Alliance and our four partner organizations, the International Quilt Museum, the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. All of our textile talks are recorded and available via YouTube, and we'll share a link to that playlist with all the talks in the chat box shortly so you can catch up on any of the ones you've missed. The Quilt Alliance is the smallest member of this group, but our mission is huge, and that's to document, preserve, and share the story of all quilts and all quilt makers. As a quick reminder, you can use the chat box for greetings, comments, or technical help, and you can select whether you'd like to send your message to everyone or just presenters. If uh, you have a question, please do enter it in the Q&A box. Uh, if you have a question for our presenters, we'll have time for Q&A shortly, and uh, questions won't get lost as easily if you put them in Q&A rather than the chat. You can also turn on or off live captions by clicking on the live transcript or CC button on your Zoom controls. Today, we're going to turn over the mic to three colleagues representing the American Quilt Study Group, or AQSG, a fellow nonprofit that collects quilt enthusiasts through research and community. AQSG members study, collect, and enjoy textiles ranging from the very earliest quilt fragments to studio art and modern quilts. AQSG Executive Director Carrie Dell will be joined by independent researchers and quilt historians William and Charlene Bonagiorno Stevens to talk about researching inscribed names on antique quilts. William and Charlene will explore research techniques for illuminating the lives of the women who created these inscribed quilts. Bringing a quilt maker story into view this way underscores the Quilt Alliance's vision of no more anonymous quilt makers. All right, Carrie, I'm gonna turn it over to you now and thanks so much for joining us. Good afternoon, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much to the Quilt Alliance and Amy and Emma for allowing us to share these gems of, uh, of a couple of people with, um, with all of you because um, I had the opportunity to hear Bill and Charlene's uh, talk at a virtual study center in February and it's fascinating. So you're gonna love it. Um, and speaking of, Charlene Bongiorno Stevens is an independent researcher and longtime educator. With extensive teaching experience in Kent, Ohio, she was also faculty at three universities and colleges in Connecticut and Delaware. She left the position as the executive director of student success and retention at a Delaware college to now pursue her long held interest in antique quilts and research the makers of mid 19th century quilts. William Stevens was the William Mather Scholar in History at Trinity College in Connecticut. After two de decades in education, he left to pursue a business in antiques, speciali specializing in poster art, particularly World War I related posters and art posters. 
As an expert genealogist, he has expanded, expanded his area of research interests to include 19th century name inscribed quilts. So what a great couple, and you are really going to enjoy this. Um, so without further ado, I give you Bill Stevens and Charlene Bongiorno Stevens. Thank you, Carrie. Let me share my screen here. And welcome to everyone. We are really pleased that you're joining us for this Textile Talk presentation. And thanks to the American Quilt Study Group for sponsoring us. Just like most other AQSG members, we're both passionate about learning all we can about the names on antique quilts and to make those makers come to life. And we're looking forward to sharing our research methods with you. So let's begin by taking a look at what we will cover today. We're assuming that you already have basic skills at researching. So for the first part of the presentation, we will spend time covering various genealogical record groups and show you actual examples on the screen of these records. The rest of the presentation will go through several possible research scenarios by highlighting by highlighting six inscribed quilts with pictures, how you would research any names in a similar quilt scenario. But our main goal for this presentation is to help you create a three-dimensional picture of the people who wrote their names on these textile works of art. We're focusing on 19th century, since that's the time period that was the most popular for name inscribed quilts. There's time again for questions at the end. All quilts pictured are or were owned by us and the images are under copyright. Please no screenshots or copies of these slides on any social media sites. Our presentation is under copyright and we ask that you can just rewatch it if you need to see the pictures again. This is an overview of the researching process. We would need many more presentations and honestly, we could give a whole presentation on any one of these quilts, but this is where you can start. Our first section will be what kinds of tools are available for me to use and where can I find them? We list on this slide the most common portals to access records. Remember that these sites, such as Ancestry.com, do not own these records. They simply provide access to them, and you can find some of the same records that are on Ancestry on Family Search, other portals, and also. In, from in-person research. These are the vital record sets that we're going to be looking at, and they will reveal the personal information. Again, no need to copy this list, just access the recording later. Now let's take a closer look at some of these record groups to see what they contain. But more importantly, let's see how each record group can be useful in different situations. We will begin with the records that most people look for and look to first, census records. In the 19th century, census records are divided by which half of the century in which you were looking. Before 1850, the only names on census records are those of heads of households. Since these were typically males, few women are named in these pre-1850 documents. If a woman was the head of a household, widowed, or not married, then their name would appear. This is not to say that there isn't useful information in these early censuses, but when you are looking for the name of a pre-1850 female, pre-1850 censuses are typically not a great research. Let's look more closely at these censuses. The 1850 census is the first to break down people by name, including women and children. There's a lot of useful information in this census. For example, column three, name, column four, age, column five, sex, column seven, profession, all of which are really helpful sources of information. Also see column eight, the value of real estate. Also look at column 12, literacy level, for example, this tells you whether or not the quilt maker could have written her own name or any of the other names appearing on a quilt. That's the good news about this census. It has great information. On the minus side, don't take any of this information as being absolutely correct. For example, column three name, 
you are going to get a lot of phonetic spelling of names since a lot of the people were foreign or may have had accents. In addition, children were often given nicknames. Catherine becomes Kate. Rebecca is Becky. Wilhelmina is Minnie. Don't get frustrated if you can't match the formal name with the nickname. Column four age is another place for problems. You will get wide variations in this column. Census ages are not based on actual birth records. They are the ages the head of household reported to the census taker. And the ages of women in particular, as we'll see later, can vary greatly from one census to another. So take age with a grain of salt. Still, the 1850 census remains a great source in the 19th century as a baseline for other research. The 1860 census saw some minor changes. See the comparison in these images. For example, see how column eight in 1850 has expanded into columns eight and nine in the 1860 census. Particularly in rural America, one could be rich in land, but poor in cash. So if you are looking, for instance, at an 1860 quilt, and it has all of these expensive fabrics in it, and the family is cash poor, then you might want to think about that and come up with an alternate way to document how this quilt maker could have afforded to make this quilt. The 1870 census has in included quite a few changes, some of which can be really helpful. For example, parent birthplaces, when newborn babies were born, recent marriage dates, educational levels, and a category called constitutional relations. This indicated if you were a male over 21 and whether or not you were eligible to vote. The 1880 census expanded on the 1870 census and now enlarged the details of health information, educational information, and gave the birthplace for the sighted person and the sighted person's mother and father. The 1880 census is a far cry from the 1850 census, but what of importance is still missing? Well, you only have a general idea of birth date and you still have little idea of the exact date, for instance, when a couple was married. The breadth of the census information has expanded, but we still have holes in the information. Also note, in 1850, 1860, 1870, and 1880, you can only assume relationships among people. Typically, the head of household would be first, followed by his wife and children, but there is nothing that verifies this. Most of the time, this is true, but not all the time. Sadly, the 1890 census has been lost for research since the records were essentially all burned. Thus, the 1900 census is the last census useful for our research on 19th century women. Some of the things we can learn now are, for the first time, we see what year a couple was married, and even more important, how many children were born and how many survived. This very personal information can be helpful to find children and those who died. For example, if you have a quilt made in 1860 for a child, but you can't find that child in any subsequent census, you can look here to see if the mother had lost any children. The number of years married is important information to assist in finding when a name change for a woman occurred and when they went from their birth name to their married name. You may hit a roadblock because you have the woman's married name, but not her birth name. But the date of the marriage could help you find those marriage records. We'll give some examples of this later. But what if you can't find the person in a census? Well, we'll look at different types of records that can help you find that person. If you can't find the person in the census or it's unclear, then you need other records that are workarounds to help you get the information you need. The following slides show examples of some different types of records. We're using screenshots of actual records we found when researching an 1846 inscribed quilt made at the Vermont Asylum for the Insane that we wrote about in 2020 Uncoverings, the research journal of AQSG. Also, we reference the so-called 1841 Jane Gordon quilt currently in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. 
and the article we published about it in Blanket Statements, AQSG's Winter 2021 publication. Let's look at the big three of research. In order to accurately document the quilt maker, you need the who, the when, and the where. If you can't find the quilt maker's name, where they lived, and when the quilt was made immediately, there are places to look for workarounds, which we'll discuss later. Note that we're talking about birth records, not birth certificates like we're, what we're used to today. And these differed from state to state. For the first part of the century, we may have to rely on religious collections, such as baptismal records, to find out birth information. In either case, some church records of birth, but not all, are available on sites like Ancestry or Family Search if the records have been digitized and made searchable. If not, you would have to find, go and find the original document. The same thing holds true for marriage records, our third category. The two types of marriage records are civil and religious. Typically, there are marriage records by county or city in the last third of the 19th century. So if the marriage occurred in that last part of the 19th century, you might be able to find it if you know specific county or city where they were married. For earlier records in the first half of the 19th century, you may have to depend on religious records. Same limitations as with birth records. There has to have been a record created. It has to still exist. And on portals like Ancestry, it has to have been digitized and made searchable. So for example, in this record that we have here, Jane Gordon in 1841 was a Methodist. So we knew that a record would have to be found in a Methodist church record. And it was in Philadelphia, so we were really lucky because many of the church documents there have been digitized and are available online. So the marriage record pictured was important because it led us to realize that the Gordon marriage did not match the inscription on the quilt or what the Philadelphia Museum of Art had recorded. Death records are much the same. Death certificates are typically a 20th century concept, but death records were kept by counties earlier and some cities in the last third of the 19th century. Prior to then, as with birth and marriage records, death records are typically kept by the city or county where the death occurred. What you see here on the left is the death record for George Short Reed Lane, the actual recipient of the so-called Gordon quilt. To the left is the actual 1879 death record from Philadelphia. The curiosity here is that Lang didn't die in Philadelphia, but he was important enough to include in the city death records. The piece of paper shown on the upper right is a request from his doctor asking that he be included. So we really lucked out on this one. Here is an example of an earlier civil record in Philadelphia to let you see how informal they actually were. On the lower left by the red arrow, this is a scrap of paper written by a doctor sent to the city recording the death of seven-year-old Mary Brainerd, whose death inspired the Philadelphia Museum's Brainerd applique quilt. Notice how informal it is and how easily it could have been lost. It's just a scrap of paper. In addition, as with birth and marriage records, death records are also kept by various churches, so you may need to look at that church for the record itself. With deaths, however, there are a couple of additional resources that we can use. The first one is burial records, which are kept by cemeteries and their associations. Searching these cemetery records is helpful, but you need to know where the burial took place. A more specific popular site is Find a Grave, which provides searchable gravestone pictures and inscriptions. However, we need to caution you about Find a Grave. Find a Grave has been compiled by wonderful volunteers, but it is not vetted for accuracy. No one checks any of the entries to be sure they are correct. Be very careful with Find a Grave. For example, on the right is the entry for Angelica Whiting, the maker of our asylum quilt. Through research, we learned she is not buried at the asylum cemetery, even though her Find a Grave asserts that she was. Another resource is the city directory. Now we're used to the 20th century concept of telephone directories, but in the 19th century, city directories help people to locate a person or business in a specific town at a specific address. They're great resources. Directories often gave information about employment, 
which can be very helpful if your quilt maker had a connection, for instance, to a dry goods store or someone in the trade. On the left, you see the cover of the 1823 Philadelphia Directory and the entry indicating the earliest entry for Jane Lang, who owned a dry goods store. Above it, you see the entry for Jane Gordon's mother, Rosanna, who also owned a dry goods store. You can find some of these directories in Ancestry or Family Search and other portals. Other can be found online for larger cities in particular through a Google type search. Tax records give a picture of the family's wealth once you know where and when they lived. See if there are any tax documents that indicate that. For example, look at the 1864 income tax records for Jane Lang and her brother George on the bottom left. You can see Jane paid a great deal in taxes, indicating how much money she must have made in her dry goods store. Land records and map records are also helpful to understand where a person lived and the size and use of their property. For example, if they were farmers, how much land did they own? Their acreage size would give you an idea about their wealth. Maps show exact locations within a city, town, county, and knowing neighbors around your subject gives you more places to search for information. On the upper right, we see an 1871 Vermont map of the town where Mary Young, our asylum quilt recipient, lived. You can find her home, her church, her burial site. Now again, you can find some of these records using your usual portal of ancestry, family search, etc., and others can be found by searching either county or city for their tax or land records or maps. Again, other records can be found for larger cities online through a Google type search. Wills and probate records are great resources for learning more about families. It was also very helpful to understand what circumstances, for instance, recent widows were forced to confront. Uh, on the left, you, on these, you can see the records for the will of John Lang the father of Jane and George Lang. John's wife, Margaret, was required to pay $1,000 to secure this will, which then was a huge amount of money. And the fact that she signed the will tells you she could read and write in 1813. It's also interesting to see the inventory of inherited items. You never know what will show up. Note items in particular two through eight in John Lang's inventory. They're all textile related. Prior to the internet, newspapers, periodicals, magazines, and books could only be accessed as physical copies. You'd have to hope that back copies still existed, but the chance of easily finding copies, say, of 19th century newspapers was pretty slim. The advent of the internet and sites like newspapers.com and genealogybank.com allow you to look at digitized copies of printed materials. In the case of the Gordon quilt, we were able to read articles as early as the 1820s to learn how Jane Lang grew her Philadelphia dry goods business. We were able to read birth announcements, marriage announcements, and daily news about her shop. Please note, you will be reading 19th century publications and the language and terms will reflect that time period's attitudes. Obituaries, are other news items that are particularly helpful since they give even more detailed information that is found in an official record. Family trees are popular now on portals like Ancestry, Family Search, etc. Many, many people have done work on these, assembling their family trees and other trees. We can't stress enough that these personal family trees must be used with caution. Errors in family trees are rampant and people copy them and like on social media, these errors go viral. Some mistakes are copied over and over and over again. Look at an online tree critically and see if you see any obvious errors. If you do, then use that information with caution. Here's an example of why you should use your critical thinking skills when looking at online family trees. The tree on the left, and I've obliterated the name of the person who created it, was the suggested ancestry hint for Mary Whiting Brainerd, the recipient of the Philadelphia Museum applique quilt. Our tree information for the same woman is on the right. 
there are red flags on the left tree that tell you to be careful of the information. So look at things critically. There are only two sources. There's only one record. In addition, the spouse is listed twice with different birth and death dates. The children are listed multiple times with different names and different dates. Anything you put in your genealogical tree should be documented. This is the same as providing a citation for scholarly research. Family lore is really nice, but it's often very wrong. Remember, the best resource available is you, your patients, and your critical thinking skills. Take the time to look at the records and then think them through. See if what you find makes sense. Take your time, sleep on the information, give yourself breaks to let the information consolidate in your brain. It will often your brain will make sense of it all when you return. So to summarize the records and info we just presented, all of the record groups are available to access through different portals or sites. They're not owned by Ancestry or Family Search, but made available for you to use. Many records are also available at in-person locations. We know this information is a little bit overwhelming. So now let's look at some real life examples of how we use records when studying specific name inscribed quilts and how we got around some roadblocks. So let's look at these to find out the names on your quilt. We are going to look at different scenarios represented by what information is on that particular quilt. And then we will teach the process for each of these. Let's begin. Here's our first example to study. You have a quilt with one block that gives a name, a date, and a location. This quilt looks like a slam dunk. It has a name, a date, and a place. What more could you want? But let's see how we can apply some of these research tools we just talked about, as well as realizing their limitations. This is the start of your critical thinking exercises. First, look at your quilt before you start researching. Look at the block design, the fabrics, the type of binding, and the ink, inking or names itself. I will show the inking on this one in the next slide. Each of these can assist you to make a generalized, educated guess about the age of the quilt. And here it is. We have the name of Lydia Josephine Bunting, the location Mount Holly, and a date of 1851 which sounds awesome and really clear, but when we Google the town of Mount Holly, we find that there are at least six states with a town by that name. Were there any soft clues in the quilt itself that could help you make a reasonable guess which state it was in? Again, look at the quilt construction. Fabrics use colors, block pattern, binding type, etc. And which records should we use to begin our search for verification and to draw a picture of who Lydia Josephine actually was. Well, we'll go to the 1850 census first. So we're going to use that closest census to begin searching for Lydia Josephine. And we find her there. She's listed as 15 years old and born in New York, but living in New Jersey. But she's living with people with a different last name, Ben Scheuch. And who is Hannah Bunting? Is that her mother? Is it her grandmother? Is it an aunt? We don't know yet. And look, a new fact. Eliza Van Schoik is a milliner with quite a bit of real estate, $4,000. That's interesting and also worth remembering. So to answer some of the questions that arose from the 1850 census, we could go to 1860. Well, Josephine is there too. But in 10 years, she's only four years older. And Eliza <clears throat> Van Schoik now has a millinery establishment plus some cash, too. Notice here also, Josephine, as well as Hannah, are directly associated with the millinery establishment. And also, there's a servant listed, which tells you a bit about the relative wealth of the household. Now, please note the DO in a line on many records is an abbreviation for ditto, from the Latin meaning as previously said. If you want still more information, some states have midpoint censuses, which can be very helpful. New Jersey happens to be one of those states. 
in the 1865 New Jersey census, we find corroboration that the three women were indeed living together. Remember, finding more sources to corroborate your dating makes your information more reliable. But we still don't know who the Van Schoiks were, and we don't know the relationship between Hannah and Josephine. We still have no proof if she is her mother or aunt or whatever. So let's look at the 1870 census. And we find now 32-year-old Josephine living at home with Jacob and Elizabeth Bunting. Now, the census designation at home is typically used for a child of the head of the household when the child was not engaged in work outside the home. The phrase keeping house is usually reserved for the wife of the head of the household, in this case, Josephine's mother, Elizabeth. To point out some of the vagaries of the census accuracy, note now Josephine was born in New Jersey, not New York. And 82-year-old Elizabeth Van Schoik is with them too. Now who's she? And there is Elizabeth Norcross listed below Van Schoik. Well, to abbreviate it for this presentation, we simply looked elsewhere and found that Eliza Van Schoik is Jacob's older sister and Hannah is an unmarried sister. So to begin, let's see how we can now take one of these facts, like where Lydia Josephine was born, and use her father to verify the accuracy of that statement. The 1850 census said that Josephine was born in 1835 in New York City. So let's try to locate her family in New York City at that time. We go to the 1835 city directory for New York City. We find Jacob Bunting as a Mason living there. So we now have some pretty good corroborative proof of residence. So Josephine very well could have been born in New York. With this information from the censuses, then we can use our other research tools to find out more about Josephine Bunting and her family. In case you had questions about whether or not a 15-year-old could have made it such a quilt, let's think critically about that question. This is where you apply critical thinking skills to see if it makes sense. Josephine lived with her aunt, who was a skilled seamstress who owned a millinery establishment and therefore had access to many different dress fabrics. She worked there in that store herself for 15 more years. The quilt shows evidence of the work of a beginner, like a place which is not photographed on one center edge where before adding the woven tape binding, she put a tuck in the edge to square it up. And the pic on the, uh, in the picture on the right, you can see that the sashing doesn't quite line up. This quilt could have been used by Josephine to show the skills she was learning, much like a cross-stitch sampler or earlier for schoolgirls. Given the great inscription on this quilt, it was a relatively easy task to search for Josephine and create a great story about her. Now let's look at a slightly more difficult scenario. This is a crib quilt, small with cutout appliques and hand inked names in the middle of each of the uh, cutout pieces. What does the quilt tell you? Think about the time period in the 19th century so you can see if you are close when we find the actual dating. Just from looking at it, we can assume that this quilt is a 19th century quilt, but how can we narrow that? We did this mostly through which last name the women used on the quilt. We have four blocks with just first and last names, but just one block with the name Mrs. with the word Mrs. before her name. So we have four unmarried women here, and since when and if they get married, their name will change, we can use those potential marriage dates to narrow the time period. Note Hetty's name was not legible enough to assist in our research. So this is where we start. Let's compare the last names on each block to get marriage dates. So let's begin. Now, making a timeline can help, especially if you're a visual person. From church marriage records, we found that Charlotte Simpson was married in 1853. If the quilt had been made later than 1853, her name would have been Charlotte Gast. Therefore, that's our end date, and therefore the quilt dates to before 1853. 
Now let's take a look at Kate Bellahan. We couldn't find a church record for her, but in looking in newspapers, we could find a marriage announcement for her marriage to George Goodman in August 1851. So now the construction date for the quilt has been refined and now shifted to before August 1851, since after that date, Kate Bellahan's became Kate Goodman. So now what we'll try to do is find the earliest possible date for the quilt. We know from census records that Mrs. M. Margaret Rhodes was married to Jacob Rhodes in the 1860 and 1870 censuses. We couldn't find any church record for Margaret, but we could find a previous marriage for her husband, Jacob, to his first wife, Elizabeth. We searched Elizabeth Rhodes and found a newspaper article that you see on the screen recording first wife Elizabeth's death in July of 1850. So there could not have been a second Mrs. Margaret Rhodes until after July of 1850. Now, no, the spelling difference is in the last name. Census takers heard the names and guessed at the spelling. But we've now narrated the construction of the quilt between July 1850 and August 1851. Now, we may never get any closer than that, but for a quilt with no date on it, that's pretty specific. So let's go to scenario three. Okay, here's the next one. Look at the quilt, and I know it's just a small section, but hazard a guess anyway. Look at the pattern, the fabrics, and the quilting. The next slide shows more of, the, of the, this quilt. And here it is, dated 1858. She couldn't have made it more easier for us to date it, but we wanna know more about this woman, where she made the quilt, more about the vast number of fabrics in the quilt and why she used an older method of cross stitch instead of inking for her name. And to get this information, we need to know more about her background. We're looking for a person living in 1858, somewhere in the United States. Before rushing to ancestry, slow down and look at the info on the quilt. Her last name, Reinwald, is a German name. It's unusual, but look for different spellings. Consider alternative spellings. So the first thing we do is go to the 1850 census. And we find her easily in Amherst, New York, even with her name spelled accurately. We learn she is married and has children born in New York. Based on the age of the children, we can assume that she was married before 1840. And we know her age, and we know that she and her husband, Adam, were born in Pennsylvania, not in New York. So carefully read now the information on the census, names, ages, and the money her husband has. Let's see if that evidence is consistent on the 1860 census, which is the closest date to that of the quilt. So looking at this information on the 1860 census, they're still in Amherst, but husband Adam has advanced his career. He has increased his worth from 800 to $3,000. He owns real estate, he has cash. Now look at the 1870 census. Wait a minute, it's a different town. Did they move? Continue to be curious. Google Williamsville, New York, and you'll find that it was created out of the larger town of Amherst. They didn't move. Williamsville was a section of Amherst and it had become a village on its own. One important hint, when one typically searches for a name, the common method is to search vertically, looking at parents, grandparents, and so on. By searching the Lane and Reinvolt families laterally or horizontally, looking at siblings, aunts, uncles, etc., you can take them back to their origins in Germany. For Adam Reinvolt's family, for example, you learn that they were Schweinfelders, a persecuted Protestant minority from Silesia. They settled in eastern Pennsylvania in the 18th century. You may be familiar, for example, with the Schweinfelder Museum in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania, that has a wonderful quote collection plus many other items made by these immigrants. But by searching for people horizontally, you can also get a much better three-dimensional picture of the quilt maker. You can learn more about families, especially if you hit a roadblock when searching vertically. Change your search and look horizontally. Again, look at siblings, uncles, aunts, cousins, etc. 
Scenario four is a much easier one. What happens if you have multiple names, a date and a place? This quilt has all of the information that you should need to verify its provenance. We can never ascertain the reason why the quilt was made if it's not written on the quilt. We have a date on the quilt, but we don't know exactly when the quilt was made, only a dedication date for the church. But the information to learn more about this quilt was pretty simple to find. You can search the census for the town of Elmo, Missouri and find as many people as possible, which we did. If the church doesn't exist anymore, which this one does not, and you find that by searching the church on Google, then contact the supervising organizations. In this case, the current United Methodist Church. We called UMC headquarters. They have an archives with an actual historian who proved to be very helpful. This kind of quilt is an easier one to begin with, but let's look at a more difficult variation. This quilt for scenario five has alternating squares of red and white in a triple Irish chain pattern. The block in the center is embroidered the Thursday Afternoon Social Club, founded February 4th, 1897. Surrounding blocks contain many embroidered names. The quilt is machine pieced and machine quilted. So to begin, make a list of all the names on the quilt. But before searching for names, Look at the names and see what you could learn from them. For example, many of these names are German, like Friederike Schwarzkopf. Then where do we begin looking for the genealogical, geographical rather, locations for these women? Is there a particular searching order that might be helpful? So start with an unusual name. For example, Emma Zorkulen. There's no magic to making this choice. You're just trying to save yourself time. So we begin in the 1900 census and look for Emma Zerkulin to see where she lived. As we search and look at multiple names, we found that indeed there is a specific location overlap. And that is Edwardsville, Illinois. But we need to find out something about the group, the Thursday Afternoon Social Club. Now, censuses won't help with this, and neither will most record databases on ancestry or family search. And a Google search wasn't very helpful. So where do we go next? In this case, we went to newspapers.com to try to find the group. You enter, in quotes, the Thursday Afternoon Social Club and hit search. Now, remember to put quotation marks around the whole phrase so it narrows the search results. And here is a newspaper article from February 12th a week after its founding, that records the name change. What happens if we have multiple names, but no date or place? Well, let's focus on that. This is our last quilt. It's a typical friendship type quilt with a chimney sweeper album block pattern with hand inked names. Some fabrics are repeated with real simple quilting. Multiple name Multiple name quilts can allow us to find locations and dates through looking through what can be called overlaps, which are repeated locations. There are 49 inscribed quilts, blocks on this quilt. And as we said, first make a chart listing all the names by block. Then look at all the names in your list. Does anyone in particular stand out? Now, there seem to be a lot of names from the same family, the Scribner family. But out of all the names, one name in particular does jump out. This is the block that stands out. It says Reverend on it. We know that many of the inscribed 19th century quilts were associated with churches or made by the members. We just looked at two examples from Elmo, Missouri and Edwardsville, Illinois. That, that, thus, when we find Reverend on a block, rather than searching random names, we now have one name that might lead us to a location faster than any of the others. So we took a different approach with this quilt. We began by researching again in the 1850 census. There was an Isaac Newton Cundall living in Eastern Connecticut where he was going to school. Some might think this is not helpful because he was a student, but where is he going to school? You can search school directories and learn that he is at Amherst College in Massachusetts. And then he went to Andover Theological Seminary. We could look at further censuses but we decided this time to go a different direction and look for anything written about Reverend Kundal after he left seminary. 
we looked in a compendium like newspapers.com or genealogybank.com and searched for Reverend Kundal by name after 1850. And we find a newspaper article in the New York Observer in 1855 that tells us that Reverend Ian Kundal has taken a position in a newly formed church in Rosendale, Wisconsin. We found where he went. This was a faster way to find the location of the quilt, but we need to corroborate this. So now we look for other names on the quilt. And if we follow Reverend Kundal just a few months later, we find he has married Sarah Elizabeth Scribner in 1855 in Rosendale, Wisconsin. That's why Mrs. S.E. Kundal is on the quilt. So now we have a place for the Kundals, but what about everybody else? We have a lot of Scribners, and I know that some of you are itching to go to the 1860 federal census, but Wisconsin had a state census in 1855, the very year that Reverend Kundal both took the pastorate and was married. What's nice about losing this local simplified census is it has the last names of everyone living in the very small town of Rosendale. So now we can just read the whole list of inhabitants and quickly match our names on the quilt block inscriptions with the last names on the censuses. Now we had a tremendous advantage in that Rosendale was a very small town, fewer than a thousand inhabitants, including children. So it didn't take long to scan the list of names and match them to the list of names on our quilt. So what you find is that 47 additional names have a relationship with Rosendale, Wisconsin. For each of the rest of the blocks, we now have a starting date of 1855 and a place, Rosendale. We aren't quite finished. We need to date the quilt itself. We know the earliest date the quilt could have been made is March 1855, because that's when Sarah Elizabeth Scribner became Mrs. S. E. Kundal. But how do we narrow the dating? We note that there are a number of children on the blocks. Child Arthur Disbro was born in February 1856, which means this was not a Kundal marriage quilt or a quilt for the church's opening because both events happened before Arthur was born. So this establishes an earliest date for the quilt of February 1856, since little Arthur is named on it. By employing the same techniques that we used on the Lancaster crib quilt that we talked about earlier, we can determine a latest date for the making of this quilt. When we did this, we found that the latest date the quilt could have been made was June 1856. So the quilt was made between February and June of 1856, pretty close dating for an undated quilt. So let's go on and review what we've learned before we take your question. What you want to find initially is the name, date, and place for the maker of the quilt. Start with the closest census to when they lived, for females after 1850, since that's when they began being named. Take notes on the records as you progress through them so that you can remind yourselves of names, dates, and places. Probably use a pencil so you can erase some of the stuff. Try to expand on what you learn from a census by using other types of records. It's really important to use your critical thinking skills to be sure that all documents you are using corroborate each other. Remember you're trying to build a three-dimensional picture of an individual, so the more you know about them, the better it will be. At each step, ask questions that you want to be able to answer when you're finished. Thank you so much for your participation. And we hope this has clarified a bit of the process for you. I realize, and Bill and I both realize, this is a huge amount of information. So take advantage of the recording and go back. And please feel free to email us a question if you have one, or connect with us on Instagram or Etsy. And I guess, Carrie, you're going to handle Please. questions now? Yes, we have comments and we have questions. We have one, we have a couple of similar questions and they um they want to know about the inscription um one my quilt has a signature but it is nearly impossible to read the faded ink i wonder if there's any way to bring out the signature a couple of things that i have used is if you have an android or an iphone take a picture and reverse it to black and white to get rid of the color and sometimes that helps also, 
get a really good, not expensive, just a really good 10 times magnifying glass and use that to be able to look at it. Sometimes it's really difficult to see them, um, but that those two things have helped me. Okay, um, Victoria wants to know what happened to the name Lydia in front of Josephine? Okay, as with many people, uh, especially some with German heritage, they use their middle names as their more familiar name. So Lydia Josephine, for example, would have been her formal name, but among her friends, she would be Josephine. So you get a formal name for this inscription, but that was usually by her dropped in a more familiar conversation. Great, okay. How would you handle slave or plantation records? Oh, right here. Okay. How would you handle slave? They are a resource, okay? And you have to recognize uh, that indeed these are, are delicate subjects for people and they can in some ways still illuminate whatever you're studying. We recently helped a person out with a quilt who had no idea that her ancestor who made the quilt was a slave owner. But that is a reality of the situation. And you have to be careful about making assumptions. I mean, this in that case, the family was wealthy and potentially the enslaved person could have helped make that quilt. In fact, could have made the quilt, but you can't prove that. So you've got to be really careful about using our 21st century attitudes and ideas to make assumptions. Good point. Um, Natalie wants to know, can you speak to which research sites require a paid membership to use? Well, Ancestry is a paid site. Uh, family search you can use, uh, and that is, uh, you do sign up as a member, but that is a free service. And you will find that that pattern is pretty much the case in all of these other kinds of records that are sometimes available free, and sometimes they are, like many things on the internet, behind a paywall. The other thing to remember is a lot of public libraries have a, um, have an, a, a, a subscription to Ancestry. So you can go to a public library and do some searching. Okay. Um, is there a repository for researched quilts? No, there isn't. And we should have something like that. <laughs> um, the last time that we talked about name inscribed quilts, we learned of two other, there is another quilt made by the Bunting family that someone else on the other side of the country, we're on the East Coast, on the West Coast has. And we have found another quilt that um, is a sister to a quilt. So we need a repository. I don't know how to get one started, but we should really do that. Yeah. Oh, and, and Pam Weeks has a comment. I've researched inscribed quilts for years and have come across several women with two first names that were frequently reversed. She appears as Rebecca Avis Sibley in half the sources and Avis Rebecca Sibley in the others. So that kind of goes along with what was Bill was saying yes. earlier. And people, and people change which name they want to use at whichever point in their life. And remember in some of the census records, the person with that name is not the one giving the information. It could be an elderly parent or somebody else and they may just flip the name. Um, have you returned signature quilts to organizations when identified? Uh, we are attempting to do some of that. However, the important thing to remember is some organizations are not capable and don't have the resources to take care of quilts. So if it's a really small historical society, they may not even want the quilts. Um, and sometimes family members don't want them. Um, you know, it, it, it's a delicate issue. And 
I don't know a specific answer for that, but if we can find some place that is capable of taking care of it, we definitely will return it. Yeah. Um, is there, there, there are two questions that are similar that I'm gonna ask together. And the first one, is there a way to ID quilt dates based on the ink used? And the other one was, does the style of writing give any hints to the date? Yes, it definitely does. Um, as far as the ink used, I am not an expert in the type of ink, so I will just give a general idea. Earlier inks that had certain chemicals in them ate away at the fabric, and it's pretty difficult to read those names because wherever the ink was put, it had sort of a brown um, halo around it, and the, the fabric is gone, so that's an earlier one. Um, the, the other, the other thing that you can do is to look at, um, look at the type of, of a signature and there are, are certain examples of different kinds of calligraphy that were real common in Pennsylvania German households. And the cross stitch on the Lane, uh, Marianne Lane Reinwald quilt was popular in Eastern Pennsylvania where she grew up and where she was born. So that's why she did that. It can give you a general idea, but again, here's where critical thinking comes in. You add all these pieces together. The type of ink is not going to tell you the exact name because people used inks for many years and they had homemade recipes for making ink. But you can add that to all of the other factors that you find and come up with a probable uh, assumption. Okay. Um, oh, and I just wanted to add Pam, who asked the question, or well, actually Pam commented earlier, and she's an AQSG member, so very knowledgeable, said, I thought the quilt index had a section for inscribed quilts. Haven't looked for a couple of years. Um, I, I don't know that it does. Um, I, I can't can answer that. Definitely check that out. Check and, it out. Yeah. Let's see. Um, is there any way to access the census records for free without going through Ancestry? Yes, you can typically just, if you're going to, I'm going to use Google as a generic. If you just put in, for example, 1850 census and Google it, there'll be many resources of the public census records. Because the census records are public. Ancestry does not own them. Okay. Um, this is a is a request. Please post websites you referenced, such as for census, when you don't know the location. And let's see. I think that's sort of in the beginning slides that they can go back and and look at them. Yeah. And if you have a specific question, just email us and we can help you. And then, what do you recommend to use to name and date modern quilts so they will be easy to ID 150 years from now? Um, I, I don't know if they're talking about researching them or putting inscriptions on them. Inscriptions, you can do a lot of things with them from actually, you know, uh, writing something on a piece of fabric and putting, that, putting it there, or actually printing labels and putting them on the back of the quilts. And I need to do that to a lot of the quilts I have. So we need to really work at it. Um, if she's talking about how to date modern quilts, researching modern people is way more difficult than researching people in the 19th century, because with all of our strictures on privacy and everything else, for example, the 1950 census is the most recent one that came out. So it's pretty hard to look for more modern people. Okay, and then where do you get your quilts for research? All over the place. Our 1846 um, asylum quilt, believe it or not, we found it over a fence at an antiques fair, um, an outside antiques fair. And when we got it, I wasn't, didn't even see the insane hospital inscription on it. I just saw that it was a quilt with dates and names on it. And we look for those in particular. So you can find them at tag sales, at yard sales, online. Auctions. Auctions, everywhere under the sun. Just look. <laughs>
Yeah, and then two comments. There's several questions, so I would encourage you to email um, Bill and Charlene with with questions because we we don't have enough time to get to them. But um, Pam Weeks just said, just looked at the quilt index, and although it was a quick look, there does seem to be a section for entering inscriptions. Right. And then Taryn added it in the Q and A. She added a link. She said, here is info from Quilt Index on Signature Quilt Project. Wonderful. Um, so yeah. Someone asked about the quilt behind us. Yes. Um, this is a recent find. It is a Quaker quilt with names all over it. We got it last week, so we have not even started. I'm putting it away because otherwise I'll go down another rabbit hole <laughs> trying to figure it out. <laughs> got to keep things in order here. But it's a Quaker quilt from 1845, probably Delaware, or Chester County, Pennsylvania. Near Philadelphia. Well, thank you so much, Carrie and Charlene and William. That was fascinating. I learned a lot that's not only useful for quilt research, but also genealogy and other historical research. Yes, and I'm so glad that we'll, we'll have the recording as a resource to revisit because there's so much great information there. Um, and I also wouldn't be a Quilt Alliance member if I didn't put in a plug for labeling quilts you're making now, everyone, you can make these quilt research jobs a lot easier in the next hundred years. Um, so don't forget. Uh, I would also just quickly like to invite everyone to join the Quilt Alliance for our annual fundraising virtual event, Quilters Take a Moment, which starts tomorrow, the main event. Um, you can find more information and tickets at qtm2022.org. I hope you'll join us. Some of the, you already have joined us for a couple workshops. And next week's textile talk will be Fabulous Surfaces, Queer Maximalism X Machine Dazzle, presented by the Museum of Arts and Design and the Surface Design Association. So again, thanks to our sponsors and for everyone who attended. And thank you so much, uh, Charlene and Bill and Carrie. Um, for allowing and our sponsors for allowing us to make Textile Talks a free series. And thank you all for joining us today. Thanks.